I do some consulting work on American the feeling in the room was You powerful. don't ever say to her that what about the shower coins? She doesn't pay discussion on the ethical we laugh. more of a community. We're trying to back up currently doing in autism. An international risk management consultant by day, the former opera singer Michael McGlarris turned his passion for artists Marsden Hartley, John Marin, and Lynn Ward into what critics say is virtuoso filmmaking. He and his wife Terry Templeton founded 217 Records and later 217 Films. We'll talk with McGlarris about his love of modern art, his latest documentary, Oh Brother Man, The Art and Life of Lind Ward, and about which artist's work he'll be focusing his filmmaking energies on next. Here's our conversation with Michael McGlarris. Michael McGlarris, welcome to the conversation. Thank you. It's nice to be here. There's, uh, there's nothing conventional about you or, or the subjects of your documentaries, and I say that because by day you run an international business consulting firm. And... Uh, Later in, in life, you became a, a filmmaker. And so I, I want to begin, before we talk about the films you've worked on, I, I want to know what did the risk manager in you say about going out on that limb and producing your very first film back in, I think, 2003? Yeah, we started it in 2003. We finished it in 2005. It took two years out of my life uh, and th that of my wife. And the straight answer is, I think some of us get riskier the older we get, particularly if we've, uh, you know, established ourselves in a particular profession or the business world and we, we sit back and say, um, is there something I've always wanted to do? Uh, what's that remaining thing? And with me, it was to make a film. And we approached uh, a, a very wonderful videographer by the name of Jeff Layton and said, we want to make a film and it's on this subject. And when he got done laughing, at what we had proposed. He well, saw well, we were serious and we just started. <laughs> so the good news is if you surround yourself by, as you do here in the studio with professionals, the, the job gets done and, and it can get done very well. well. Well, the interesting thing is the subject uh, of that very first film was, was Marsden Hartley. Yes. And what struck you was uh, a several hour long poem that he had written, an ode to a, to a family he met in Nova Scotia. That's right. Um, and the film was uh, Cleophas and His Own. Uh, what was it about picking that up and reading it uh, and deciding, I have to make a film about this? Again, someone who was not a filmmaker. Yeah, well, interesting story. Um, I uncovered on eBay for $3 this art catalog of this obscure Nova Scotia show that was done of some of the work that Hartley did from, from the Nova Scotia period and thereafter. And smack dab in the middle of his catalog was this story called Cleophas and His Own, which had been discovered in a dresser drawer in the little village of Korea, Maine in a few 1943. Days after he died. A few days after he died. I read it. Uh, I was moved literally to tears. And uh, we went into the studio and we recorded an audio recording of me for our record label that we own. And my wife and I were in Washington. I had just given a reading of Cleophas and His Own at the Phillips Gallery in, uh, in Washington, uh, D.C. And we were in a cab, and I, as we were riding back, I said to Terry, you know, that's a film. I think what I'll do is I'll dissect this and cut it up and make a film out of it. And I did that, and it was just terrible because I'm not as good a writer as Marston Hartley is. Uh, we decided one day to scrap what I had written and, and film the whole thing as written, two hours and 27 minute film. Uh, there were some people then that advised me that the film was too long and that it was a very stupid idea. And there are some people today who sit through the film and say, did you really intend to make a two hour and 27 minute film? And the answer is yes. It's a fascinating, fascinating story. It is an interesting story, but, but the time makes me backtrack because you actually performed yes. a six and a half hour opera. Uh, a performance of Hiawatha. Not an opera. Actually, I read the poem. Okay, Hiawatha. you read the poem. Okay. Yes, from from Six cover to cover. Six and a half hours. Yes, yes. And, and, and I understand. Don't that the remind audience, me, please. <laughs> but I understand that a, a, a good number of the audience stayed in that theater. Uh, not a good number. In fact, we at, by the end it had actually increased. Uh, it was in um, honor of the the bicentennial of the birth of Longfellow, obviously who wrote who wrote Hiawatha. And we had made a recording for the, uh, we'd been asked to make a recording for the bicentennial. We did it, and then I turned to my wife and said, let's do a public reading. And we thought, you know, that four or five or six sort of hearty souls would show up. First of all, the place was mobbed, and it was mobbed six and a half hours later. They sat through the whole thing. 
and uh, it was one of the highlights of my life. It was the most enjoyable experience to have to read uh, that poem aloud. How, and how could you sustain your energy? I mean, a six and a half hour performance, to me, that's mind boggling. <laughs> well, I was trained as an opera singer, so standing on stage and using your breath right and making sure that you conserve the energy you have is an important part of it. But when you're swept along by this poetry, this magnificent American poetry in Hiawatha's, Hiawatha is the, is the tale of our first American superhero. And when you, when you read it aloud, it resonates, and it resonated for the audience, I think, that night. You went on to uh, produce another film about mm -hmm. Marsden Hartley, I and did. after that, a film about John Maron, and, and, and more recently, a film about the graphic uh, artist, uh, Lynn Ward. What's interesting to me about all of these people that you focused your attention on um, is that they were innovators. These were the pioneers uh, in, in their respective fields. I think you're right about that. Uh, in, in, in Lynn's case, of course, in Lynn Ward's uh, case, he wrote the first American graphic novel. If, in fact, you write a novel, I guess you do, if it's just with pictures, pictures and no words. I, I, I keep using the wrong words, but you know what I mean. I also think you read a graphic novel, too, for the same reason. But yes, Lynn was a pioneer, John Maron, in, in his way, a pioneer, Marsden Hartley, uh, one of the great uh, Robert Hughes said about Marsden Hartley, the great art critic Robert Hughes from Time Magazine, said that Marsden Hartley was one of the four or five most important painters of the 20th century. And while he he never enjoyed much success, Hartley, Hartley, yeah, absolutely, he knew. In fact, he said, "My name will register forever in the history of American art." That's exactly right, and it does. It, when you when you say Marsden Hartley to an art aficionado or someone who appreciates his work or knows about his work as I say in, in the documentary film we made about his life, you watch that person's eyes get very large, Marston Hartley. He's an iconic figure. And he appeals to a certain sensibility. Uh, his work uh, sold very little in his lifetime. And what was sold was largely a one collector, a man by the name of Hudson Walker. Uh, now, you know, you can't touch a Hartley oil for five, six, seven million dollars. And, 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 and in fact, he one essentially died broke. Died broken, and, and and I think one of his pieces sold recently. Something he painted in 1915 for 6.3 million dollars, which yes. is more than any other. Hartley uh, would have appreciated that, a small fraction of that, I think. <laughs> uh, and, and yet, this is someone who uh, I, I kind of wonder why you fell in love with him, because even as I watched your film, he didn't seem that lovable, that approachable, that mm. uh, he was a bit of a loner. Uh, Maybe it's his lack of lovability. But I think in Hartley's case, there's something extraordinary going on there. When you and I think about painters, we don't necessarily think about great writers. Or when we think about great writers, we don't think that they are also paint. Hartley was both. Hartley was a profoundly fine writer, poet, essayist, and Cleophas in his own, which he never really intended to have see the light of day. That was a private manuscript. It was actually discovered by a woman named Louise Young, who was a, a, a woman in her 20s when Hartley stayed with her family in Korea, Maine. She actually discovered that manuscript. We got to know Louise while we were making this film. She died in 2004 and never saw the, fil uh, the, the finished product. But we got to know Louise. We stayed in her home. We got to hear firsthand what Hartley sounded like and looked like. And as you know, I play Hartley in the okay. film as well as directing it. So I got a lot of tips from Louise. About what he was like. What he was like and how he conducted himself. He was a fine writer, ex extraordinary and important painter, uh, and an extraordinary man at a time when he was, he was a gay man. And it was very hard to be gay and, and uh, be closeted in those, uh, in those days in, in the, at the turn of the century and, of course, right up through the 30s. What was it like uh, walking in his shoes? Uh, uh, you'd have to ask my wife, I think. but. Uh, living with Marsden Hartley, as my wife did for a couple of years, perhaps that's another interview at another <laughs> time. The the prosthetic nose, right. the padding, the chin, and the cigarettes. Uh, I'm constantly, not a, yeah, he had a cigarette in his hand throughout the entire film. Constantly, and the entire film, I went through. Uh, we shot that in two 12-hour days, 12-hour sessions, uh, of me essentially looking, as you know, in the film into the camera, with uh, with the exception of stuff that we shot later. Uh, I went through, I think, six cartons of cigarettes in two days. Uh, and then I went out and took a breath of air. <laughs> so far, I've been fine. I haven't reverted. <laughs> what, what are art critics saying about that film? And, and the reason I ask is there have been books written about Marsden Hartley. Uh, he, he wrote a number of books himself. Mm. Um, why did we need a film? And what do film critics 
uh, say about it? Film critics that have talked about this film because of its length uh, either uh, make a comment that its length is is magisterial or magnificent or say, gee, maybe he could have cut it down to 90 minutes so I wouldn't have had to sit there for two hours and a half almost. We, we get wonderful mixed reviews about people about the length of the film. I, I actually meant art critics. What do art critics what, say What about art it? critics say about it is that that's, uh, uh, or have said about it, is that that's a portion of Hartley's life that needed further explanation. Mm -hmm. Here's this wonderful manuscript that Hartley begins as he's in Korea, 1936, he finishes it in 1941 and 42 in Korea, Maine. He starts it in Nova Scotia, he finishes it in Korea. Uh, he types it himself, it's hand typed. And it is intended to sort of cleanse his soul about the relationship with the Francis Mason family. He was very deeply in love with one of the sons, who of course drowns, as we know. In, was it in, reciprocal? I never knew if uh, it was some of us think, or not. Some of us think that perhaps it was. Uh, Hartley was certainly prepared to live the rest of his life in Nova Scotia at that point. It didn't work out that way. He did promise to come back when he left. And we should say what happened is this young man and his brother died in a, in a storm uh, out terrible, at sea. Terrible, terrible hurricane at sea. They were drunk. They were coming back from the mainland. The Masons lived on an island less than a mile from shore. And these three guys, in fact, one of their cousins drowned, to pile in a small 14-foot skiff and try to make it to the island. And, of course, they all drowned, mm -hmm. which provokes this outpouring of Cleophas in his own, the story, but then these portraits of the Francis Mason family that Hartley paints starting in 1938, long after he's left Nova Scotia, so the memory is still with him. Now, I, I know how you got from <coughs> Marsden Hartley uh, to John Marin. They, they actually were both introduced to the American public yeah. uh, by Alfred Stieglitz. And they knew each other. And they knew each other. There are pictures of them together. Uh, both of them painted Maine. They sort of mm -hmm. became the painters uh, of Maine. Um, they actually vied for that position a little bit. The interesting thing about uh, Marin, and you talk about this in the film, is that he could paint with both hands mm. at the same time. Mm. Yes. There's a wonderful story. We actually, when we were shooting uh, up in, in down East Main near uh, Addis, South Addison, where, where Marin lived, where he died, we actually encountered a gentleman who had seen, as a small boy, Marin painting and, and literally looking at a scene and doing this, sketching to eventually do an oil and doing this and, and looking and just doing this with both hands, he could work very rapidly. And when you see there's film footage in the film of Marin actually sketching, uh, it's amazing the quickness, like Lind Ward with which he could work. Here is a Marin who can paint with both hands. Um, and yet what he became famous for are few brush strokes. I don't think I've ever seen a painting that has so few mm. brush strokes. Less is more. Mm. And that makes me, that, that, that sends me to Hemingway, and I feel like is he is he the the to painting what Hemingway is to writing? Less is more. Can I write that down? <laughs> That's a film. That's a new film. No, you're right about that, and I, I've never made that connection. Um, th there is in modernism, you know, in the first twenty plus years of the the first twentieth century, the American century. If you think about this, um, you've made an excellent point. If you think about stripping things down to their essential natures. Hemingway, Gertrude Stein, John Marin, who could paint Trinity Church or the Woolworth Building with very few brush strokes. And right? you knew exactly what it was. And you knew exactly what it was. There is this, there, there is this, almost this feeling in American modernist art and literature at that time. What, what if we start to reduce things to their essential values? Do we lose anything when we reduce it? It's almost an experimentation. And I think you'll find with Hemingway, certainly with Gertrude Stein, certainly with John Merritt, what you get, in fact, is more of the essence of the thing rather than less of the essence of the thing through the reduction. Does that well, make sense? It does. And, and what's interesting about that is that people often ask Marin, according to your documentary and the things I read, what is it that you were trying to convey? And he said, well, it doesn't matter what I was trying to convey. What did you get? What, what did, did you get? get from it? What did you take away from it? Yeah, and I think it's through that concept that you just mentioned about the reductionism that, uh, that says, uh, you know, I, I don't have to overdo my telling you what this scene or this particular image means to me. I, in fact, can reduce what it means because maybe it means more to you and allows you to insert parts of your own meaning and interpretation in it. These films are essays, and, and some would even say they're devotional films. You're, you're a devotee of uh, Hartley and Marin and, and Lynn Ward, who I want to speak about, talk about uh, more in just a moment. Yes. Uh, I would say these are homages, and 
Um, the films I've decided to make, we call them essays in film because there's a lot of verbosity. I write a lot of these films and it's my writing, so I, all the credit and blame goes to me. But I think what, what we can't do, what my wife and I can't do, and my wife is my executive producer, we can't make a film about something we don't feel really strongly and passionately about. And if, if it, there's one of the reasons why we started to make these films is because we saw films about American painters and painters and artists in general that seemed devoid of passion to us, somehow sort of magically seemed not to be on the cusp of passion at all. If you like a painter and if what you see on the wall moves you, I'm not so sure that it's a bad thing that you express yourself in the most passionate or uh, devotional terms, uh, provided that you show all of the painter and all of the character of that painter at the same time, which we try to do in these films. But this is all about passion. We have to feel passion about what we do. It seems like it's all about passion, but also it, it needs to be about something that's truly American. Yes. We, Despite the fact that these men all studied abroad. They studied in Paris. They studied in yeah, Berlin. Well, and yet they know. brought this back. And I was trained as an opera singer. And, and when I was younger, it was a long time ago, I had to go to Europe to sing because there, the opportunities were fewer here. Um, but there's some of that legacy. Fortunately, with young singers today, that doesn't happen much anymore. But it, it did happen in my time. I think what's really important, though, is that we are committed, my wife and I, to making films about the American artistic experience. We've been tempted and we've been asked to make films uh, uh, about a European subject in particular, but it's, we're just not going there. We're completely devoted to, uh, to helping people, our fellow citizens, understand the greatness of the American artistic legacy to the best of our abilities. And you say in a uh, little film that's online uh, that it is middle class America that keep the arts alive mm -hmm. and that, that you are proud to be part of middle class America. Yes. What I find interesting about that is uh, that Lynn Ward, for example, he wanted the world the, the way uh, the Barnes Museum in Philadelphia, uh, the founder of that museum, wanted average Americans to see and appreciate his work. He never numbered, for example, his work because he didn't want them to be uh, 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 more expensive than they should be. Right, he didn't want to inflate, inflate their value. That's a good point. And, and Lynn was the, the absolute epitome of what it was like and what it is like to be a middle-class artist of great genius. I mean, here we've got a man born in 1905, he dies in 1985, he's right in the middle of this American century that's produced Hartley and produced Marin and produced Jackson Pollock. And what we've got is we've got a man, a devoted father, two wonderful daughters, a wife who is also very gifted as a writer. They live in suburban New Jersey, of all places. You know, they've got a, they've got a lawn, they've got trees. It's the ultimate middle class existence. Yet in that studio, he becomes the father of the American graphic novel. Uh, you know, uh, Art Spiegelman has, has said and owned to the fact that he wouldn't have done what he had done if Lindy Ward had not existed. So all the graphic novelists and, and comic book creators who came after him stood on the shoulders of Lynn Ward. Yes, when you say Lynn Ward in front of someone who either makes graphic novels or writes comic books or does comic work or does graphic illustration, when you say Lynn Ward, you get the same reaction that I just mentioned ago about the name Marston Hartley. There's a pause, there's a sharp intake of breath, the eyes get large. He is an iconic figure. He's the father of the American graphic novel. And he was extremely prolific. Prolific. More than 200 books. Stuff that we still uncover to this day that turns out to be commercial work or book illustration done by Lynn Ward. Uh, we're very, very fortunate, my wife and I, to know Robin Ward Savage and her husband Mike Savage, who in fact live not far from Penn State and an and ardent, ardent Penn State. I mean, there's no place in their house that doesn't say go Penn State, which, which is wonderful to visit with them on. Uh, but the artwork that resides here at Penn State, which is a gift from, from Robin and Mike and Nanda Ward, um, are, is the most magnificent body of work. And, 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 and to pour through it, we're talking of thousands of images in your library here at Penn State. And that doesn't count what's at Rutgers or at, or at George Washington or any place else. And Penn State holds an annual graphic novel they do. conference. Uh, and, and created a, a Lynn Ward award. Exactly. For graphic novelists. Exactly. Th thanks to the hard work of Stephen Herb, who's 
everyone knows here and who's uh, an advocate, a passionate advocate of the graphic novel. Now, uh, it seems like there's there's one really interesting to me little nugget in all of these, and I, one of the things I find interesting about uh, about Lind Ward is. Uh, as a child, he knew he was going to be an artist. He he realized that his name, spelled backwards, was draw. Was draw exactly? Yeah, imagine it. Uh, but but isn't that a wonderful story? Robin tells it at the beginning of the film. Uh, it, it you know we we get the most wonderful uh, as we tour with the film. We get the most wonderful reaction to that because isn't that the most innocent and childlike reaction? You a child, you write your name. You're five years old. You realize, of course, right. that what it spells backwards. Why not? Why not do that? As a, uh, as a passionate uh, thing for the rest of your life. Now, Ward, you say, chronicled uh, uh, the, the 20th century. I mean, he was, his, his work, some of his most famous work, was done before the stock market crash. Mm. God's Man was published the week before the stock market crashed. And what's God, what, what is God's Man about? about? It is about corporate greed. It is about the corruption of innocence. It is about what happens to our American cities, the moment that um, capitalism with the ugliest side of its face is allowed uh, to, to reign unmolested and, and, and unconstrained. He was prescient in a lot of ways, prescient, wasn't he? Prescient, and that's, I think I use that word in the film. Not only was he prescient, but he saw what would eventually happen if we didn't pull ourselves back from this precipice of reliance on, uh, on, on the corporation taking care of us and essentially at the same time silencing us. What I wondered as I learned about these artists, and I have to say, I didn't actually know about them until I watched your film. But you do now. I do now. <laughs> uh, but, but, I, but I knew about the lost generation. Of and course. I thought, why, uh, why isn't Marin, for example, uh, as a household name the way Hemingway is? Yeah, I think, it's, I, I think part of that is how we treat uh, these artists and writers in terms of their uh, their being famous beyond what they did. Uh, when, when I say Hemingway to you or to a friend of yours or a friend of mine, the reaction is maybe not, oh, uh, you know, I love the novels of Hemingway, as is something about his persona or something about the way he lived his life. So there's a kind of a dichotomy between the artist and, and the way the life was lived. With, with Hartley, there's some of that. With Marin, there's almost none of it because Marin, again, was a family man, extremely devoted to his wife and his son, John. Uh, and all Marin did all day was, if he wasn't hunting or fishing or being on his boat, was just work. And with Lind Ward, you have this ultimate example of this guy next door, short man with glasses, with these with loving wife and two loving children living this suburban existence. But what you don't know is in that studio, he's illustrating Ernest Hemingway's work. He's illustrating Beowulf and creating lasting images of really important and, and artistic he, And he values. won every award uh, yeah, that yeah, counted. Uh, the Caldecott Award and the book that, that I have to get my hands on and see, uh, The Biggest Bear. The Biggest Bear, that, yes. Which was a Caldecott winner. It was, it was in 1953, I think, yes. And, and children are still reading it's that children book. Children are still reading that book, yes. It's wonderful to know that. Now, Marsden and, and uh, Marin, they did a lot of work about uh, on Maine. Yes. And Maine became a part of them. Uh, Maine actually produced or inspired so many artists, the Wyeths, all three of them, uh, Georgia O'Keeffe. Uh, what is it about Maine? Winslow you, Homer. It, it, it's Winslow Homer. Winslow Homer. In fact, you said it was uh, someone who, who said that, that Marsden Hartley is no Winslow Homer. Yes. That, that almost was partly inspired you to make that film. Yeah, the, uh, uh, that was someone who walked on the set one day and made that comment to me for some reason that will remain forever an, an enigma. The, the, you, well, you've been to Maine, so, and so you know what I mean. There's a quality of the light there. Um, on a fine summer day in Maine, when you're standing, particularly in down east Maine, along that rocky coast, and you see the subtle change in the light, when you see the quality of the light, when you see the way the light dances off the surface of the, of the slate and the granite and, and the wonderful crashing waves that are so wonderfully portrayed in Homer's work, for example, it's easy, it's easy, if you're an artist, which I'm not, it's easy to imagine yourself trying to capture that moment the way that Hartley, the ultimate expressionist painter, the way that Marin, the ultimate I don't know what kind of modernist painter is the best way to describe Marin and Homer. You know, the, the way they captured those images is, is all about the main we understand and think about in our dreams and certainly in our subconscious. Mm -hmm. Who are you working on now? We're working on a film called The Great Confusion, uh, the 1913 Armory Show. So, a hundred years ago, 
February 17th. Alfred 19th. Stieglitz. Alfred Stieglitz. Uh, three men got together, one of which was the great and wonderful painter Walt Kuhn, and they decided that it was time to introduce America to modern art. And so they went to Europe and pulled hordes of paintings from Europe. They invited Marston Hartley and John Maron and Charles Sheeler uh, and John Sloan and a raft of wonderful American uh, painters who were painting at that time to come to New York and exhibit uh, in an armory, in fact. And so more than a thousand works for one month between February 17th and March 15th, 1913 were there and people walked out. They didn't uh, like it. Being either in love or okay, confused. Okay. <laughs> in fact, there's okay. a wonderful passage where Teddy Roosevelt, who was no longer president mm -hmm. in 1913, walked in, saw Marcel Duchamp's new descending staircase, turned to one of the promoters and said, this man is nuts. <laughs> and so we've actually, in this film, we're actually shooting a wonderful actor, Joe Wiegand, who is the world's most foremost impersonator of Teddy Roosevelt. He'll actually be on the set when we shoot in February, sort of reading parts of the essay that Theodore Roosevelt wrote. Well, so we're back to modernism again yeah. and the American experience. All right, well, we're <laughs> looking forward to it. Michael McGlarris, very nice talking oh, to you. Oh, it's been great. Thank you. I hope you enjoyed our conversation with Michael McGlarris. Comcast subscribers can watch this program anytime on Penn State On Demand. Find out how through our website, conversations.psu.edu, where you'll also find more information about McGlaris's films. I'm Patty Satalia. We hope you'll join us for our next Conversation from Penn State. Production funding provided in part by the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and by viewers like you. Thank you.